<clears throat> All right, welcome. Welcome to Legal and Ethical Environment of Business. This is Professor Gera Pujol. Um, and um, this is lab number one. Uh, this class is devoted to the main sources of law. But what I want to do is to make it interesting is I want to focus on um, a scene in the movie, The Social Network, which I've included in the module uh, for this class, um, the face mash incident. And I want to talk about um, hacking um, and um, look at hacking uh, from the legal perspective and uh, also a moral perspective or ethical perspective and ask um, when is hacking um, uh, a, a violation of law? And so for this, um, that's what we'll do in today's class <clears throat> or today's lab, if you will. Um, uh, uh, but before we do that, let me just make a few administrative announcements for those of you in the class. I am recording the class. Um, just so we have a record uh, in case you want to go back or uh, um, because I'm making attendance optional uh, this semester, um, uh, give everybody an opportunity to um, review the materials. Uh, what I'm going to do also is um, uh, let me jump in, do a screen share, uh, if you'll allow me to, so I can show you uh, the module and make sure that everybody has done all of the assignments in the module. Um, which will remain open until the end of this week. Um, as I explained in the introductory or orientation class, I should say, the introduction class, um, each will have five labs and each lab I'll open up a one module per lab uh, with all of your assignments and supplementary readings. And so let's go ahead and uh, jump in here. Let me just uh, show this um, just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, there we go. All right. Uh, you see here, I have the um, uh, home page of the course, and you can either scroll down. I posted the link. Uh, uh, by the way, I'll open up the next module on Monday, and then that module will correspond for lab number two, which, you know, if you're attending this live, um, we'll meet in two weeks from today. So go ahead and um, uh, you can also access the modules here on the site. <clears throat> and um, here you can see, oops, I, I, let's see here, accidentally closed this. Oh, let me see if I can just make this a little bit smaller. Uh, hold on here, let's see. Um, It does this sometimes. Uh, let me do this. Uh, all right, let's see here. All right. Okay, now we're back in the module. Apologize for that. And um, you'll see I've divided. I, I believe I went through the module in the orientation class, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I don't want anybody to lose any points. Um, as I've made this as straightforward as possible, you'll see there's an open book quiz. Um, on the materials up top of this module, you'll see there's a discussion post where I just want a good faith response. Um, how, what do you think of the face mash? And then there's a survey for this lab. The survey used to be live. That's how I would take attendance, but I'm just going to keep the survey open until the end of this week. Um, and we'll go over those survey results uh, at the end of this class. Uh, so you can just see uh, where you and your fellow classmates uh, stand on these various uh, uh, points. Um, the main thing I want to I want to share with you here is uh, if you haven't had a chance, I think the most important reading is going to be uh, this um, couple of things in here. Uh, this Harvard Crimson article, um, hot or not, um, website briefly judges on looks, and I believe I have it open already. Let me see here. Maybe I don't have it open, so I'll go ahead and open it right now. And maybe I can make it, I'm trying to make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, this is an interesting article for those of you who haven't seen the movie. 
um, it gives you a very good synopsis of what the face mash of the face mash incident and um, what happened and what the facts were. Um, I will, um, you know, before we begin, I just want to say uh, an important background material that's kind of not in the article and um, not explicit from the movie. Uh, but let me uh, uh, let me just share this with you. The, the face mash incident is really important for two reasons. Um, one is <clears throat> it's um, you have to understand that this is 2003. And so um, the Internet is about 3000 days old around that time. You know, the uh, commercial Internet uh, <clears throat> where you can just log on and access Google or, you know, any any of your favorite websites. One of the interesting things, though, is with the exception of Google and Amazon, um, a lot of your favorite websites didn't exist back then. You know, Facebook is not going to be launched until a few weeks later. Um, YouTube is not launched until 2005. Um, Twitter is not launched, I believe, 2008. Um, the iPhone doesn't come out until June of 2007 when it's commercially available for the public. And even there, you know, you had to wait in line, go to the Apple store. Um, and so what's really remarkable is that, you know, 2003, even though, um, for example, some of the music I, I played at the beginning of the class, still a, sort of a classic, enjoyable song. Um, but the world was, was quite different in that we didn't have all of these social media platforms. And if you recall in the first survey question, and we'll look at those results, and I asked you, you know, what, what platform do you use the most? That platform probably didn't exist back in 2003. And that's the other reason that's so remarkable about Face Mesh, because as much as um, you don't, you know, you may not like Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, you have to hand it to him. He struck a real raw nerve with the Face Mesh in that a website, you know, went viral, as we would say today, in a world where that word didn't exist in the way we use it today. You know, there was no, like I said, there was no YouTube, Twitter, iPhone, you know, for something to spread quickly and as quickly and dramatically as Face Mash did to merit a front page article on the Harvard Crimson, you know, that was pure word of mouth. That was pure people forwarding stuff via email chains, you know, uh, you know, talk about old school, you know, it, but, but the website was so, you know, addicting, you know, and I like to begin with that because at the end of the, uh, at the end of this, you know, in our lab number five, when we get to the end of the semester in November, we're going to see as one of the major criticisms of social media today, that it is um, almost, you know, too good um, um, you know, for, for us, you know, and that, and that, you know, and, and think about your own social media habits, you know, very, very addicting to be just scrolling down, you know, when do you stop scrolling, you know, um, does Zuckerberg have our best interest at heart? You know what I mean? At the end of the day, he just wants to sell us ads. You know what I mean? What, why, why do we allow these companies to basically dominate, you know, and in many ways, many ways, you know, it's, it's a, it's an open question whether our lives have really been improved in any meaningful manner. You could even argue, you could even argue that our lives are in fact much worse because of these social media addictions and, you know, um, the way it distorts reality. And the reason why I point out, and I'll go back to the screen share, the Harvard Crimson article is because all of those issues in a microcosm were taking place or being discussed and debated at Harvard in 2003. You know, and one of the things I want to show you here is the one person to go on the record and to say that this was wrong was Leila Bravo, um, the president of Fuerza Latina one of the student organizations at, at Harvard. And, um, you know, this is just a, you know, and you, you think about it today, um, you know, you think about it today, you know, um, uh, these are the same discussions that we're having 
All right, with that, what I wanna do is let me jump into the survey and then let's use the survey as a way of, because what I wanna do in this class is introduce you to the main sources of law. And so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into, and I'll just do it, for, I'll just do it through here. Um, I'll jump into the survey. Actually, let me do it this way. Um, oh, you see, I hate it when it expands like that. Uh, let me just jump into the survey and we'll do survey statistics and we'll get real time. So if you haven't done the survey, now is the best time to do it. Survey for lab number one, which is what this is. And then we'll go to survey statistics. I'm on a different screen here. All right. And we'll let that pull up. Um, my first question, as I was saying, and you can see about um, less than a third of the class have done the survey. So you want to get on this, you know, because it's going to close on Friday. But the point is that um, if you look at these results here, what you're seeing is that Instagram is, um, you know, none of these platforms or none of these social media sites command a simple majority. But if you look at it, a plurality, who has the most votes? Sort of like the way, you know, um, politics, you know, who gets the most votes? You don't need 50%, you just need the most votes. And you see Instagram, right, is by, uh, here has 30%. And the closest in second place is Snapchat, you know, in terms of, you know, and, and the reality is uh, we use all of these websites or you probably use, you know, a number of these websites, uh, but which one do you use the most? Which one do you prefer? You know, Instagram, it's interesting that it's, um, um, it comes out on top. But of course, Instagram is a wholly owned subsidiary of Facebook, of Meta Inc., as it's called now. So basically, you know, um, you're dealing with Mark Zuckerberg one way or another, because if you like Instagram, you can use Instagram, right? You are, you know, uh, you're using a, a social media platform that Mark Zuckerberg, you know, uh, calls the shots. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Let's go into the uh, uh, face mash incident itself and was it illegal? <clears throat> and what's really interesting here is you have a pretty vast majority say, says that it, yes, you know, it's illegal. You know, you have a 72% commanding, you know. Um, notice, right? Um, could you prove this beyond a reasonable doubt? And that's something we'll look at when we look at civil and criminal cases, you know. Um, um, was it illegal? You know, and so what I want to do here, here, I want to introduce you the main sources of law and show you how a lawyer would approach this question. But before I show you how a lawyer would approach this question, what I'm going to do is um, I want to show you how, uh, and by the way, I've included the film clip from the social network in the module if you want to see it, but I'm not going to show you that film clip. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the real life Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, when he testified before Congress. This was back in April of 2018. He testified at a couple of congressional committees. And um, th uh, this was during the um, Congress's was in Congress was investigating the um, Cambridge Analytica data breach. I won't go into all of that details, but if you think about it again, it's kind of like face match, right? There was a data breach at Harvard. Now at Harvard, right, the data was student ID photos, right? You may have your uh, UCF Knights card, right? And that's ultimately what was, what Zuckerberg hacked, you know, the Harvard uh, residential computer database upload or, you know, basically, you know, grab all of these student ID photos that he could in order to populate the face mash website. Um, and, um, you know, determine, you know, quote unquote, who the hottest student at Harvard is. And um, uh, the, the question is, you know, is, is that legal or not? And so we'll see how a, a lawyer uh, would answer that. And, um, uh, but before we do that, let me show you how Zuckerberg answered when he was, the only one member of Congress asked Mr. Zuckerberg about the face match during the Cambridge Analytica data breach uh, congressional hearings. So let me just, uh, I, I believe I have that pulled up. I've included it also in the module if you want to see it for yourself. Um, let me just double check. I thought I had it open, but I may have closed it by accident. So what I'm going to do is, um, uh, let me see here. Um, I'll just reopen it. How's that? I'll, let's just reopen it. 
And uh, let me make sure I got the volume up. I had a technical issue. And then we'll do the screen share. All right, let me just uh, expand the screen and then um, Alrighty, and then let me go back into here. And you know, when you check out this screen, uh, this uh, Zuckerberg's testimony, you know, ask yourself, how do you defend yourself? You know, one of the interesting things about the Harvard Crimson article is that you know it quotes from Zuckerberg's own blog. You know, while he's you know, quote unquote, I think it's a twelve fifty eight a.m. Let the hacking begin. I mean, Zuckerberg is literally in real time blogging about, you know, hacking, you know what I mean? Harvard, and then creating the website, you know, uh, as, uh, um, and by the way, uh, well, uh, let's see how Mark Zuckerberg responds to this. You know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to prejudge this in any way. But by the way, I should say Billy Long, you know, he's not the most famous member of Congress, but my understanding is he comes from a uh, long political dynasty, originally based in um, Louisiana. You may have heard of um, uh, uh, Senator Russell Long. If you've been in Washington, D.C., there's the Russell Long Senate building. Senator Long was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee from late 1950s, I believe, early 1960s, all the way until he retired in 1986. He was considered after the president, the most powerful man in Washington because the Senate Finance Committee, they have to, they have to approve all spending and tax bills. You know, very powerful, probably the most powerful congressional committee, you know, in the Senate. Um, if you haven't heard of uh, Senator Long, maybe you've heard of his, his father and Billy Long's grandfather, Huey Long the famous populist governor of Louisiana in the 1930s. You know, before there was Donald Trump, there was Huey Long, you know, a very famous politician with national political ambitions until his life was cut short um, back in the 1930s. And so, uh, so this, guy, this guy comes from a really uh, storied uh, political dynasty, you know? And so um, here is his questioning of Mr. Zuckerberg. Face mash and it's still up and running. No, Congressman. Face mash was a, a prank website that I launched in college in my dorm room um, before I started Facebook. There was a movie about this, or it said it was about this. It was uh, 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 unclear truth. Um, and the, the, the claim that face mash was somehow connected to the development of Facebook. It isn't. It wasn't. Just coincidental. The, time, the timing was the same, right? Just coincidental. It, it was in 2003. Okay. And I took a down and it, right. it actually has nothing to do with it. Put up pictures of two women and decide which one was the better, more attractive of the two. Is that right? Congressman, that is uh, an accurate description of the prank website that I made when I was okay. in the okay. I did, But from that beginning, whether it was actually the beginning of Facebook or not, you've come a long way. That, what? What? So that's one way, right, to uh, defend yourself, you know, prank website. Um, what's really interesting is Zuckerberg, you know, this is a real life Zuckerberg. He takes kind of a shot at the movie. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, is this really true or not? What I will say in defense of the movie on my end, and, and, and I'll actually make two points, um, you know, um, the Jesse Eisenberg voiceover during the face mash scene, you know, when he's hacking, Harvard's uh, computer databases. That's word for word from the Zuckerberg blog, you know, back in 2003. The other point I would make is that, um, you know, um, while yes, Facebook was launched in uh, February 4, 2004, and the um, this whole idea for Face Smash began on Halloween of 2003, uh, in reality, the domain name for the Facebook was registered in, on January 11th, 2004, 10 weeks after the face mash incident. So, you know, 
Um, you, you, again, you decide for yourself whether the movie is an accurate depiction. Is Face Smash really the moment where Zuckerberg realizes, wow, this site went viral, right? Not because there were quote unquote hot girls on the website, but because the people using the website may have potentially knew, known who these girls were in person, you know? And, um, or are they two separate things that have nothing to do with each other as Zuckerberg, um, you know, tries to uh, testify to uh, before Congress. So I just throw that out there, you know, um, that I find the movie personally to be, to be quite credible and uh, you know, more believable than Zuckerberg's denial there um, or attempt to separate himself, you know, from a uh, face match. But be that as it may, whether you, you know, whichever version of events you uh, buy into, you know, what about the law here, you know? And so I want to introduce you three major sources, really four major sources of law. One important source of law um, is, and I'll talk about that one last, is natural law. And it's called natural law. Um, but natural law is kind of a um, term of art for morality, ethics and morality. And, you know, I'm not going to try to distinguish ethics from morality here, but the idea of natural law kind of goes back to the founding of the Republic, goes back to July 4th, 1776, with the signing of the Declaration of Independence, with the idea that, you know, to quote Thomas Jefferson and the Patriots of 76, you know, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Now, of course, today we would say all men and women, you know, black and white, you know, um, we would expand the universe of people who are protected by, you know, God's law. This is the idea. Um, more in more recent times, you know, I would cite to you the perhaps the most eloquent um, document in, you know, probably next to the Gettysburg Address, which would be um, Dr. Martin Luther King, his letter from a Birmingham jail. And the letter from a Birmingham jail is a eloquent defense of natural law, um, explanation of why Dr. King was willing to go to jail, you know, um, willing to break the laws of Birmingham, Alabama, uh, because, he, you know, uh, uh, laws that treat people differently based on their race was for Dr. King, right? And for us today, you know, uh, uh, you know, morally wrong. And so the idea is, and you may have heard this phrase that, you know, um, an unjust law is no law. This is the idea of natural law. Um, but let's put that to one side for now, because, um, and I want to talk about so-called positive law. And this is, a, again, a term of art lawyers use. Um, positive law doesn't mean good or bad, right? It could be an unjust law, it could be bad. But positive law means, and I'll use the old fashioned term here, man-made or artificial law. Basically laws that are enacted by legislatures, for example, or you know, organizations or you know, groups that have uh, authority to um, bind you know, human behavior. Uh, so let's, let's look at the main sources of law when it comes to something like you know, a, a prank website. You know, when does a prank website become illegal? And so um, what I want to show you here is in the module I've included, um, and I'll just show it to you right now. Um, I've included, and let me see if I can, uh, for some reason, this kind of got, okay, there we go. Uh, let me, uh, let's do the screen share. Oops, 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 oops. Don't want to end the meeting. Uh, apologies here, I'm fumbling. I'm on a different computer. I've had a little bit of a technical issue with my uh, regular computer. Um, let's see here. Uh, you'll notice I've included a Wikipedia page to the cybercrime convention. Convention is what, um, is what a treaty is. It's the, sort of the term of art we use to describe an international treaty. And so this is also called the Budapest Convention because it was negotiated and initially adopted by member states of the European Union in Budapest, and I believe it was 2001, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was, if you look at the map on the screen share, uh, this is really what I wanted to show you. You don't need to know the details of the statute, uh, of the, uh, I'm sorry, of the treaty, but you'll notice that the United States is a member, right? It's a ratified 
um, I believe it was in around 2008, the United States decided to join the Budapest Convention. Right then and there, um, that's a very important aspect of international law, right? International law is, or think of the Geneva Convention, you know, war crimes and things of that nature. Um, you know, um, for international law to apply to a country, that country has to voluntarily basically accept the treaty, you know, and each country will have different legal procedures for deciding which treaties that they will ratify or join or become member states of. Um, whereas, um, you know, in this case, the Cybercrime Convention, what's really interesting is not the fact that the United States has joined the convention and that most of uh, Europe, but, you know, European countries, you know, have uh, joined the European, uh, the uh, Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. What's really interesting here are the countries that have not joined the Cybercrime Convention. If you look at the map, you know, you'll notice that um, of the big economic players, right? People's Republic of China, Brazil, India, Russian Federation, right? None of these major um, economic powers, right, have yet to join the Cybercrime Convention. But the United States has. And what's interesting about the Cybercrime Convention is that in, in, essentially it's a procedural treaty that makes it possible, easy to extradite cyber criminals from one country to another. If a cyber criminal has, you know, say fled uh, to a, another country that has also joined the uh, Budapest Convention, you know, the uh, Cybercrime Convention. Um, but that doesn't really tell us, right? Okay, we need to go look at the laws of each country, and you know what, you know when, you know when is hacking illegal? How is hacking defined? So let's go ahead and do that now in terms of the United States. And here's what you need to know when we talk about the United States, right? When we talk about the United States, we're talking about um, if anybody here is from Germany, they'll know what I'm talking about. We are a federal system federal country. That means that we have two, two levels of government. We have the federal government, right? You know, Congress in Washington, D.C., for example, um, President of the United States, Supreme Court of the United States, federal courts. But we also have, and I'll, I will lump them together, state and local governments and state and local law. So why don't, why don't we do this? Let's look at state and local law first. And here, right, um, you got to look at, you know, you have 50 states. Harvard, of course, is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I've included in the module the laws of uh, cybercrime laws of Massachusetts. I've also included Florida and California if you want to compare and contrast. And what you'll notice is that all 50 states now have their own cyber, you know, crime uh, cyber laws. Uh, but let's focus on the one that would have applied here to face mesh. And so um, I've actually, I have this one already pulled up. And uh, you'll see section 33A of the, um, of, uh, uh, you know, part four, title one, you know. So in law school, you would learn how to look up these laws. I, what I've done here is this is a survey course. I've given you already, I already looked it up for you. And if, you know, one of the things is when you look at this paragraph, I'm going to tell you right now, um, it, you know, you, it, it's kind of a mouthful, right? You know, a lot of legalese, but the key thing is it's obtaining a commercial computer service, right? Through some kind of false statement or unauthorized uh, uh, method, uh, false representation. But what's really interesting in this statute is that commercial computer service, if you look at the definition and you look at the last two words, again, it's a mouthful, and I'm not going to read. Are you them. sharing something on your screen? Because oh. we can't see it. We oh. see a desktop. Oh, sorry, sorry to that. interrupt. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for interrupting. Let me go ahead and do this now. I must have um, I must have messed up somehow. Let me go ahead and uh, show you the statute. I've been showing all this stuff. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I, I, I think I'm about to leave the meeting by accident. Let me go to the share screen. Uh, this is a, this has been a, a rough day. OK, uh, now is the statute visible? Section 33. Yes, Thank okay, you. Great. I apologize for that. It's my bad. Um, what you're going to see, and I'll just, I'll just put it in plain English, is that, you know, um, at least under state and local law, 
in the state of Massachusetts, you know, or as they call themselves, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, what you're going to see here is that, you know, basically this law punishes computer scams or scams that are done through the computer, right? When through the internet, would one person, you know, basically uh, tricks another person into giving them money? You know what I mean? But notice, right? This doesn't really apply to face smash, right? Face smash was probably wrong, right? Leila Bravo, and by the way, I'm saying probably here just to, uh, um, because I'll talk about ethics at the end of the class, you know, natural law, I'll come back to that. Um, but legally speaking, you know, um, face smash, right? Zuckerberg, he's not getting any money out of this. You know what I mean? He's not really trying to get, you know, trick people into paying him in order to see these pictures, for example, or he's not really stealing. It, while you can say he's stealing some photographs, um, student ID pictures to be precise. And while you can say that those student ID photos might have some monetary value, you might be able to come up with some kind of theory but notice, right, it's a real stretch, you know? Uh, so the international treaty doesn't apply here because Zuckerberg, he hasn't gone to any other country that's a member of the treaty. So we don't need, to, we don't need to extradition. State and local law here doesn't really appear to be relevant to face smash, you know? Doesn't really apply to what face smash is about because face smash doesn't involve any, any fraud, you know, any, any scam, if you will. So what this leaves us with is federal law. And so um, I've included in the module the Wikipedia page for the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that was enacted in 1984 and subsequently amended many times. I'm not going to go into the Wikipedia page. Let me just give you the plain English. The Computer Fraud and by the, way, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is a very important law because it would apply now right to all 50 states, right? And if somebody breaks that law and then they go to another country that is a member state of the Budapest Convention, they could be extradited back to the US, right? In, in, in that scenario. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, it makes it a federal crime in, uh, in, for anyone to access a computer, protected computer, without authorization. But what the federal statute does is, instead of defining protected computer like commercially, like you have to get you know, money from somebody else. No, no, no. A protected computer is just any computer that's connected to the internet. Um, that's a protected computer. And the idea there is without going into too much you know, um, constitutional detail is that Congress has the power to regulate commerce. And so what Congress did is in enacting the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and make hacking a federal crime what Congress is doing is, okay, we're going to protect commerce, you know, internet, um, by um, making it illegal to access somebody else's computer on the internet, you know, um, because the internet is basically part of interstate commerce. And so um, uh, the, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act makes it illegal not only to access a computer without authorization, because you could argue that Zuckerberg, being a student at Harvard, right, you could argue that maybe he has access to the student ID photos or to the websites that were populating the student ID photos. One bit of background that makes Harvard, I will say this is true about Yale as well. Um, Harvard and Yale, what they do is they have this hey, system. Hey, Jen. Oh, let me just make sure you're muted here. Uh, Harvard has this system of residential houses. So your first year at Harvard, you live in Harvard Yard. Uh, all the freshmen live in the old campus, then your sophomore year, and until you graduate, till your end of your senior year, you will be assigned and you will live in one of 12 residential houses. And so each residential house at Harvard, the movie, if you saw the movie, you know what I'm talking about, or if you read the article, right? Each residential house had its own website. And um, some of those websites were password protected. Other websites, anybody could access if you had the URL address, right? The www address. Um, and you could access those student ID photos. But the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act actually makes it illegal not only to access a computer without authorization, but also to access a protected computer or a computer on the internet um, in excess of authorization. So even if you could argue that Zuckerberg, you know, had you know, the right to access those um, websites of those residential houses at Harvard that were not password protected, right? No doubt that he went in excess of authorization when um, 
um, you know, when he actually got those pictures um, in order to create the website. So the argument is, I actually agree with the class, the website probably is illegal under federal law. But this raises a whole new and a more interesting question. Why was Zuckerberg never charged with the crime? The movie has an excellent depiction of the so-called administrative board hearing. At Harvard, they call it the Ad Board, the Student Conduct Committee. Um, and what the movie doesn't tell you, though, are two things. First of all, the movie doesn't tell you who ad boarded Zuckerberg. And the other thing the movie doesn't tell you is why was Zuckerberg never charged with a federal crime? If you go into the Wikipedia page for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, one of the leading cases under that law is the case of United States versus Aaron Swartz. And the name Aaron Swartz may not mean something to you, but if you use Reddit, if you believe the internet should be free, Aaron Swartz is um, a hero. Aaron Swartz was a young man. He was, actually, he was actually a student at Harvard, just like Zuckerberg. Well, this happened about five years later. And he was actually charged under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, not for downloading illegally student photos, student ID photos, but for accessing research articles without authorization. Um, so, um, um, uh, 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 you know, why wasn't Zuckerberg charged, right? And this is sort of like, what lawyers will call the law in action, right? The law in the books will tell you what's legal and illegal, but really, you know, just because you've committed a crime, you may not necessarily be charged. And so this is something also not in the textbook. I'll just throw it out there. This is the um, idea of, um, or the uh, practice of prosecutorial discretion. I'll go ahead and type it into the uh, chat here. Um, A prosecutorial discretion is a very important concept because basically, um, you know, the re, you know, although the, although the the you know, if it's a federal crime, we're talking about the United States Attorney's Office. If it's a state crime, we're talking about the state attorney, for example. Um, they decide whether to bring charges. You know, they decide whether they have enough evidence to bring charges. Remember, you know, it just it, you not only have to you know to prove something is illegal in a court of law you not only have to make the argument that uh, the law was broken, but you have to have facts here and prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what's interesting is in the case of Face Mash, right? Um, Zuckerberg is blogging about this, you know? The Harvard Crimson published the blog, you know? It's, it's in the article I just uh, included in the module. So this would seem like a slam dunk case, right? To prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Zuckerberg broke the law. But uh, here is the key point. The key point is that the prosecution, right, has discretion whether to bring charges or not. And the idea here is that you could argue that Zuckerberg, you know, this guy is what, 19 years old when this happened. Um, he's a sophomore. Um, the website, he took it down right away. Um, unlike the movie, the one, the one area where the movie is incorrect is the Harvard website did not crash. It did slow down considerably, but it did not crash. And so he took it down to avoid the website from crashing, you know, the Harvard. Uh, 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 so, you, you know, so the prosecution has to decide, is Mark Zuckerberg someone we want to go after? Now, what's interesting, right, is right now, Facebook or Meta Inc., if you will, they are being uh, prosecuted or in this case sued in civil uh, for antitrust violations, right? So right now the government does feel like it's worth their while to go after Zuckerberg, right? Uh, because now, you know, he's such a big and powerful individual, Facebook and Instagram, if you will, WhatsApp, all the panoply of services that his company owns, right? Um, and, so, and we'll look at that case at the end of the semester when we look at Facebook today. All right, so now you've seen the three main sources of law. Let me go back to the um, survey and um, see if there's any other questions and then talk about natural law, talk about ethics. Because I think ethics is an important uh, important aspect of uh, that I want to share with you as well as part of your college education. Uh, so, all right, let's go to screen share, and I have pulled up a survey, um, and we've seen that yeah, a good argument can be made that face mash was illegal, and that Zuckerberg was kind of lucky; he dodged a bullet. He could have been prosecuted, right? But he wasn't prosecuted. He was. Oh, uh, that's the other thing I forgot to tell you. So, who ad boarded it? It was not Leila Bravo, right? Um, you know, a student could bring a complaint and take it to the ad board, and then the ad board could decide whether to hear 
the case. But in this case, the person who ad boarded Zuckerberg was the director of residential computing at Harvard, Kevin Davis. And uh, that's explained in the article. And you know, think about it, right? You're Kevin Davis, right? You, your job is to protect Harvard's computer right, system database right, from external and presumably internal threats. And here comes Zuckerberg, right? Uh, 19 year old, right? Basically, right, he was able to hack into your system one night and create this illegal website. Uh, and so, you know, my theory is not, it's not in the article, not in the movie, but my own theory is that Kevin Davis ad boarded Zuckerberg, right, to take sort of the deflect from his own poor job performance, if you will, because, you know, how, you know, you know, uh, he, he's operating a system here that was so easily hacked, you know, in just the course of a few hours. Um, actually, this takes me, I believe, to the next survey question, and that is, um, um, so, okay, you're ad boarding, you're ad boarding Zuckerberg, right? What should be the punishment? And if you look at the, um, oh, no, that's the next question. Um, actually, let me jump and then we'll come back to the speech question. I said, I did talk about Kevin Davis. You look at these results and you add, you know, 51% um, uh, you know, of those participating would have suspended Zuckerberg. Another 19% would have even gone further to expel him. Now we have a 70% super majority here, right? This might be a reflection of maybe, you know, we live in a world like the Me Too movement. Uh, you know, we're more cognizant, you know, of uh, uh, people's rights and, you know, uh, respect gender equality, et cetera. You know, we don't want to judge people based on their looks. But back in 2003, right, what probably ended up happening, this is a private internal procedure, but we do know that Zuckerberg was not, you know, suspended. He was not expelled. He was most likely merely admonished. Um, and so, you know, he basically, you know, was just let off with a warning, you know, again, he got, he even got lucky at, on the ad board side, but that might be a function that maybe Harvard itself should have taken, uh, greater precautions, you know, for something that is foreseeable. Now we'll see, uh, in the next class, when we talk in the next lab, when we talk about the common law, when are you liable, you know, for somebody else's, um, uh, you know, uh, bad acts, you know? Could Harvard have been legally liable to the people whose students whose pictures were posted without their consent? And that's a deeper question, right? Um, the hacking question is pretty simple. Did Zuckerberg use Harvard's computer, access those computers without authorization or exceeding authorization, right? But to answer that question, we'll have to look at the common law and I'll do that in the next class. But um, there is a, um, there is, a, I skipped a survey question here, so let me go back to it. Um, here, I'm kind of surprised, you know, uh, but uh, the question is, you know, should speech rights, you could argue that, I mean, you could argue that the face mash is something of like a research project, you know, because it does, uh, the movie, uh, you know, dramatizes this aspect, but it's very true. The, the face mash used this thing called the ELO chess ranking algorithm. By the way, the United States Tennis Association and the World Tennis Association, and of course the International Chess Federation, they all use, when you have a sport that involves individual players and not teams, right? Um, they all use the chess ranking algorithm to decide who the number one player is, you know, and who the number two player is, and the number three player is, et cetera. And so the question here is, um, I'm surprised, by the way, that college football doesn't use the algorithm because it would probably be better than that committee that they have, you know, um, to decide who are the top four teams. But that's let's not get into college football right now. Um, the thing about it is, um, when does privacy trump speech or vice versa, right? When does your right to speech trump people's privacy rights? I throw the question out there because that is a current controversy today, right? Now, in this case, most people would be willing to say, you see the numbers here, 86% to 14%, right? Most people are saying that the you know, privacy interests of the students, you know, not to be judged or ranked, you know, without their consent um, should outweigh whatever, you know, interest Zuckerberg has in pulling a prank, right? And I, I would generally agree with that intuition, you know, but legally speaking, you know, um, when can you sue somebody for invading your privacy, right? Legally speaking, speech rights receive almost absolute protection. The only way speech can be punished or um, curtailed are these five narrow categories. You don't need to know it for the class, but if you're just curious, you know, First Amendment law, defamation, that's not protected, right? 
Uh, if you make a false statement about somebody that damages their reputation, you can be sued for that. Um, perjury, right? You cannot make a false statement in an official proceeding before Congress or in a court of law. That's not protected speech. Um, child pornography and obscenity are also not protected and can be punished. Um, and um, um, immediate and imminent threats of violence are also not protected speech. Um, and this, uh, ultimately, ultimately, everything else is technically protected, you know, but uh, privacy. Now, there's an interesting, uh, I just want to throw as a footnote, which makes the face mash to me so interesting. In order to protect your privacy in a, you know, sue for invasion of privacy, um, you have to first demonstrate that you had a reasonable expectation of privacy and that that privacy was invaded, right? And here's the problem with the face mash of your Leila Bravo or any one of those students, right? Zuckerberg is downloading illegally, admittedly, right, from the Harvard's point of view, uh, the student ID photos. But can you really say that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your student ID photo? Or in this case, in my faculty, you know, we all have these UCF ID cards, right? Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy when on campus, right? I may have to show this card to check out a library book, for example, or, you know, go to the dining hall, you know, get, you know, go um, get free tickets for a football game or whatever it is, you know what I mean? And so um, uh, that's actually, uh, to me, a very close question, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, um, maybe the answer to that question depends on whether any non-Harvard students were using and voting on face mesh, you know what I mean? Uh, that's a very close call. That might be another reason why Zuckerberg, you know, maybe a skirted civil liability here because, you know, it's not entirely obvious whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your student ID photo that's designed to be seen by other members of the campus community, if you will. I just throw that out there just to show you that this is actually, this case is not as black and white or as open and shut as you may have originally have believed. And that's why you always, whenever somebody accuses you of misconduct, right? Um, whether it's a student conduct committee or civil liability or criminal case, you always need legal representation uh, to get help, you know, in trying to navigate and minimize the penalty, maybe even avoid liability altogether, you know, as Zuckerberg was able to basically do in this case. Now, my last two questions have to do um, with Remember, I talked about natural law as really, if you will, the umbrella, um, you know, and the, you know, and, and, and I will say I'm very sympathetic to the natural law tradition myself. It goes back to St. Thomas Aquinas and the church fathers, if you will, you know, the Catholic tradition. Uh, I cited Dr. King and the Declaration of Independence to give you more modern examples of natural law. But here's the problem with natural law, right? Um, maybe you agree that an unjust law is no law. But how do you decide when a law is unjust, right? What happens, like, does, do, does everybody get to decide which laws I get to obey, you know? If that's the case, then we, what's the difference between that situation and anarchy, right? So natural law, basically, and I want to just end because I think as part of your, you know, well-rounded college education, you should know at least two of the major theories of ethics of natural law of morality, right? Um, and again, I'll let you decide which is the more uh, attractive theory. But the way I like to teach this is because, you know, moral philosophy now is now this whole separate course, you know what I mean? But um, the trolley problem, you know, this says now the trolley problem, you know, with, um, um, you know, uh, self-driving automobiles, this has been discussed now, you know, um, you know when should a uh, self-driving car, you know, um, should it protect the passenger and the driver in the car, you know, uh, um, um, or should it protect the pedestrians who are on the street if it has to make a choice, you know, a split second decision. It's sort of like a trolley problem type, you know, uh, scenario here. But the original trolley problem is a, what they call a thought experiment, completely made up scenario. The basic idea is, and you have to imagine that you have these six people who are tied, on, tied down to the railroad track, you know what I mean, or the, the trolley track. Um, and there's, you are standing by the lever. That's the whole scenario here. Now, there's a key caveat here is that the person in the lever and the people who are tied down in the track, they're complete strangers, right? 
Like, if you know any of the people, if any of those people, your family members or friends or, you know, uh, fellow countrymen or whatever, you maybe you're going to, that's going to change your calculus. But if these are complete strangers, you know what I mean? Um, you know, uh, or maybe one's a child or whatever, you know, that could also affect your calculus. But we're going to assume that everybody, you know how everybody looks the same here. You know, so everybody's pretty much the same age, same gender. We're going to make it as neutral as possible just to get at the core moral assumption here. And the idea is, is it morally permissible to uh, pull the lever? And what's really interesting here, you look at the results, right? This is almost like uh, the free speech versus privacy, right? Uh, most people would say it's morally permissible to prefer the lesser evil, you know? You know, um, you, uh, my own professor, uh, Guido Calabresi, described the situation as a tragic choice because no matter what you do, somebody has to, you know, somebody is going to have negative consequences. Somebody's going to perish, you know? So the question is, um, is it permissible to divert the trolley where one person dies to save the five lives? And most people, that's their intuition, you know? Um, and th here's, here is the, um, here is the theory behind that, uh, the ethical intuition. Um, the fancy term is consequentialism. And what consequentialism is, basically, you judge the morality of your actions or the actions of somebody else, you know, um, based on the consequences those actions produce. That's the, that's the essence of consequentialist moral theory. So the idea is that you're only permitted to do something bad if it's to avoid a worse outcome. That's the basic intuition there. And I will tell you, that's as we'll see in the next, you know, that's our common law tradition. There is a defense of necessity. There's a defense of uh, justification. You know, you are allowed to use force to defend yourself, you know, against force. You're allowed, you know, to, uh, 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 now, you know, the threat has to be immediate. The force has to be proportional to the force, you know, being threatened. But, you know, we have this built in in our legal tradition. But notice what happens when we change the trolley problem scenario. There's actually two trolley problems in the phil philosophical literature. And the idea of these two trolley problem scenario is to show you that we often can have different moral intuitions depending on the facts of the case. And this is why for lawyers, regardless of what moral theory you, know, you find most attractive, the facts are always the most important part of any case, not just the law, but also the facts. And so in the second scenario, you have a bystander on the bridge. And so notice, right, the moral arithmetic here is identical to the previous situation, but the facts are different. In order to save the five lives, you have to affirmatively, not pull a lever, right? You actually have to push the innocent bystander off the bridge. And notice here, right, the results are diametrically opposed, right? 25% um, uh, to 75%. Now notice there's some people who would be morally consistent, right? It looks like if you, if you look at the actual math, 11% would pull the lever and would push the guy, but most people that would push the lever would not push the guy off the bridge. And this is the other second major ethical theory. This is often called duty ethics. The fancy term is deontological ethics uh, or Kantian duty ethics. The basic idea of duty ethics, the way I like to simplify it in plain English, it's, you know, let's take the Christian tradition, the Bible or the golden rule. Actually, actually many religions have some variant of the so-called golden rule. You want to treat other people the way you treat yourself, right? Uh, the way you want to be treated, I should say, right? And, um, and the idea is that moral duties are universal regardless of what the consequences of complying with the duty are or breaking the duty are. And so you have these two different moral traditions. And that's why I would, I would say um, when we look at the morality of law and whether a law is just or not, just or unjust, Sometimes there could be good faith disagreement because we might have different moral intuitions. What kind of trolley problem are we in? Is this like the lever or is this like pushing the innocent guy off the bridge, you know? And, um, um, and you know, there, um, there may not be a consensus, you know, There's, there may be what's called moral disagreement. And so this is why I put sort of natural law in a separate category, you know what I mean? But I think most people, and we'll see this when we look at this will be a good a preview of our next class. When we look at the common law, the common law is an area of mostly state law. There is some international common law. There is some federal common law, but most common law is state law. Um, what common law is, 
are the basic background legal rules that apply to every single business organization. And the three most important areas of the common law are going to be contracts, property rights, and what, lawyer, what lawyers call tort law or injuries, accidental and intentional injuries. And so um, what we're going to see is um, um, next week, or I'm sorry, in two weeks in our next lab and next week in the next module, that not all promises are legally enforceable, you know? Also with um, 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 accidents, um, sometimes you are legally liable for consequences that were not intentional. You know, even though you have no intent to injure somebody, somebody nonetheless got injured. When are you or your business firm legally liable for that? Uh, for uh, you know, for those injuries, you know, um, and with property rights, you know, property rights also has a kind of moral dimension, you know, um, and so we'll look at property rights. How do you acquire property rights in the first place? So we'll look at the three main areas of the common law, and we'll see that you know our common law tradition overlaps to some extent with our moral intuitions, but not completely. So that's why I like to teach here moral, you know, uh, natural law, uh, morality, and ethics just to throw it out there that, you know, that may infor inform our understanding of what the law should be, you know, um, but, but people can have good faith disagreements about what is just or unjust, you know, and that will depend on your theory of morality, on your theory of natural law. I should say, by the way, this was a very gross oversimplification. There are other theories of ethics that are also equally powerful, virtue ethics, uh, contractarianism, all this kind of stuff. But just in the format of this course, you know, we don't have the time to cover all of these other ethical theories. Um, plus, you know, this is a law course, not, you know, I just want to throw in natural law in there as part of our legal heritage. But, uh, and, and just show, share with you two very influential theories of, you know, morality, which are consequentialism and duty ethics, you know. All right. Um, let me end the screen share and um, uh, do a time check. Ooh, okay, good. We are good on time. Any questions? Any um, any questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, then we'll just go ahead and end today's lab. Um, moving forward, we will continue with this. Uh, you know, I'll open up a new module every two weeks. So next Monday, I'll open up the next module, and that will correspond to our next lab, which will be, of course, two weeks from today if you're watching this live. Um, 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 and that's how we'll do it throughout the semester. Each module or each lab will have its own module, and each module will have the assignments for that lab. What I'm doing is, because I am making attendance optional, right, um, you can do the survey and all the assignments at your own pace, you know what I mean? But on the honor system, I'm hoping you do attend one of my five open sections, whether they're via Zoom or in person, uh, so you can see what the survey results are, and I can explain to you in greater detail that area of the law that we're covering on that particular module. All right, great. I'm going to end the recording, but I'll stay on the line if there's any uh, questions, comments, or concerns.